All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, <coughs> so today is our fourth class. Uh, we had a one weekend break uh, last week with a church meeting, but then we now have, um, originally we're scheduled for four more classes, but our, uh, we were able to add one more class. Um, we got confirmation from Maddie uh, Dinan from Sound Salmon Solutions. And so uh, instead of ending on the 27th of February, we'll have one more class on March 6th. So, and that's, uh, she'll be uh, present, presenting the information of what Sound Salmon Solutions does for the, uh, our local uh, salmon population. So it's, uh, you know, we talked about global stuff, but now we will have a chance to hear how climate uh, change has affected the salmon population and what we're doing about it in our, in our local area. So in our rivers and stuff in the, in the sound. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, as I said before, um, this is our fourth session and today's topic is what we can do as a church. One second. Yeah, so today's uh, Bible scripture is from Psalm 8, verses 1 through 9. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out, out of the moss of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark, bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you can care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with your glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under your feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the air and the sea of, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along, along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, how sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So uh, we're going to, uh, or we'll have actually three videos today, uh, three, uh, five, six minutes each. Uh, this first one um, is coming from the Tier Fund um, lesson plan, uh, and it's called "What Can We Do as a Church." So let me uh, change my screen. What advice would you give churches that want to do something together to combat the effects of climate change? So the first piece of advice I would give to any community, any organization, and any church that wanted to address climate change is, and you won't be surprised when you hear me say this now, talk about it. Bond, connect, and inspire. Why is talking so important? Because surveys show that while the majority of us accept the fact that climate is changing and we agree that it will affect future generations and plants and animals and people in developing countries, none of us think it will affect us and we don't talk about it. And if we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we act? People often say, well, talking about it, it just, it seems kind of almost like a cop-out. It's such a low-key response to such a large global challenge. But here's the thing. Talking about it can be the first domino in a good way this time, not a bad way. This study was released just this past year and it found that talking about it, the simple act of having a conversation, initiates a true positive feedback effect. How? Well, first of all, the more we talk about it, the more we know. The more we know, the more concerned we are. The more concerned we are, the more we talk about it. And so, as they say, these findings suggest that climate conversations with friends and family enter into a pro-climate social feedback loop. What do we talk about? We don't talk about the science or how bad it is. We talk about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it. And then there was another study that also came out this past year that I thought was so encouraging. It talked about how children can make a difference. 
they looked at children in North Carolina, which is a quite conservative state in the United States, and they looked at having those children, middle school children, receive education on climate change, but they didn't track the children's opinions, they tracked the parents' opinions. And what they found is that there was a significant difference in the parents' opinions after the children learned about the issue. That's pretty encouraging. So first is talk about it, and then second is act in community. And the good thing is this will give you even more to talk about because, again, talking about it is so important, and we can talk about what we are doing, what we've done personally, what our church is doing, what other churches have done, what other organizations have done. Acting is important, but talking about how we're acting is also important. So how can we act in community? Well, here's just a couple of examples. So first of all, you can model good stewardship. Do an energy audit of your building. Figure out how to reduce your carbon footprint and your energy bills. Create a green team of like-minded people to explore ways to uh, reduce your carbon footprint. Make your potlucks and coffee hours zero waste. Look at plant-based foods. And that leads to number three, share resources. Often people aren't quite sure which light bulbs are most efficient. What type of travel is best? Do you have a solar panel installer you'd recommend? Encourage action. Provide resources for people that they can use. Facilitate information. Facilitate access to resources and facilitate access to change. And then step number four, support organizations that care about climate change and reflect our values. Tier Fund is obviously one of those. Arasha is another one. Climate Stewards, Plant with Purpose, Operation NOAA. All of these are organizations that embody Christian values, that embody the concepts of stewardship, of caring for the poorest and most vulnerable on this planet, and also preparing for the impacts of a changing climate and reducing our own contribution to the problem. All right, so we, that was our first video, and now we'll go to our, <coughs> excuse me, our first question of the day. So Dr. Catherine Hayhoe says that the, the first thing every single one of us can do about climate change is to talk about it, why it matters and what we can do to fix it. Uh, so two questions. Do you think it's important to talk about climate change in our church? And can you think of ways that this could be, uh, think of ways of how this could be done? And just go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, it's important. And we're doing it right now. Yeah. Yeah, yes. we're doing it right now. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I just want we yeah. also had a major change when we put in the LED lights. And that was important. And it's a big step. Yeah, so the uh, that's a good point. Uh, actually, uh, I think I saw, yeah, Susan Zakos. Uh, are you able to uh, talk about our, our church uh, lighting campaign? <coughs> I am. I'm in the uh, middle of a, a cleaning project here, so I've been listening in. But um, yes, so that was a big thing that we did. Not only were our lighting fixtures wearing out, but they were incandescent bulbs, which used a whole lot more energy. And so we were able to update our system uh, and use much more energy efficient LED lighting. The other thing I thought about too was, um, uh, that, uh, and Lloyd Brodniak is all over this with the changes we made in our kitchen and uh, using, trying to be um, not zero waste with some of our big dinners and so forth and um, using the dishes that we have and not using um, disposable. But of course, with uh, COVID, that's kind of changed things as well, too. So, but definitely our lighting project was a big, big thing in the right direction. Just so you know that we had a memorial yesterday and a lot of the food came in plastic things. So afterwards we're sitting there with all the empty garbage and we're looking at the bottom to see what number it is and whether we put it in the recycle or put it in the trash. So we are watching that when we throw stuff away too. Good for you. And we're- uh, What are they doing in the nursery school? And what? What, are they doing, what are they doing in the nursery school? Do you know? At the preschool? Yeah. I know they're conscious of that, but I know this because of COVID, 
all the kids have their own like little plastic <clears throat> dish pan thing or dish drainer thing and everything they do goes in that basket and they don't touch each other's but like all the snacks have to be individually wrapped now i know so that they, they are because of covid there's a lot of things they're forced to do right now i would challenge our church to do an energy audit i don't know if you all realize but i would say at least 80 percent of the windows in our church are single pane mm -hmm. they're not insulated windows at all we replaced eight of them in the fellowship hall due to the uh, leadership of our uh, new dana in the uh, preschool but the stained glass windows in the church proper are single pane and all of uh, a great deal of the uh, caulking around those are gone there's you can go in the sanctuary and see daylight out of many of the stained glass windows. There is no insulation. There's no secondary. There's no uh, storm windows, nothing on them. And I'm saying uh, that there is a huge amount of waste of energy to heat the building <clears throat> because we are throwing it away out the windows. Yeah, absolutely. That's what. Uh, that's one of the things I when I started preparing for this class is what can we, you know, when we get to this part of this lesson plan is that, uh, you know, how do we uh, uh, convey this to uh, to these uh, proper and grounds groups and get funding for that? And, and I'm, I'm taking notes as well. So I'm also a member of the church council. I can bring this up on our next meeting, uh, but I wanted to hear first from you before I make my own decision or make my own uh, call back to the council and to the pro uh, uh, property and grounds committee. So it's good to hear that. Yes, Ed. Is there a garden at the church over where the nursery school goes? I mean, are they <coughs> able to plant anything there? Uh, for instance, I plant my old potatoes and I have good potatoes that I grow. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, that, so that, you know, you know, everything we do in the church, you know, it's not a one person job and we have to identify uh, who takes a responsibility and care for it. You know, we also want to throw stuff on the ground and then just walk away from it or we have to maintain it and keep an eye on it um, and, and, and track that information. Uh, Rick, oh, uh, sorry, uh, um, Rick, you said you, I saw you had a hands up earlier. Um, you had something to say? Oh, no, I was just. I was just going to uh, confirm what um, was said in the video that we tackle difficult uh, topics by talking about them, whether it's climate change or race, racism or sexism. I think we're doing an amazing job of that here at Our Saviors. You know, we're, we're tackling these issues because we're talking about them. We're, we're learning about them. We're wrestling with them. Uh, and I want to just, you know, commend our saviors and you in particular, Marco, for giving us those opportunities to talk about difficult issues. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rick. Um, we are Eddie. being mindful of the heat because yesterday morning when we came in, Jim Adams came rushing in and he goes, I got to turn the heat on now because we don't heat anything during the weekend, especially now when there's no Sunday service. <sighs> And he realized there was a memorial at 10 o'clock and it was very chilly in there when we first got there. So they are turning the heat down. And when we count during the week, we're in a little room that doesn't have a lot of heat compared to the office. If you walk out in the hall and into the office, there's a decided temperature up because we've got it for the people in the office, but the rest of the building the preschool's fairly chilly too because they figure the kids have a lot of energy and they're running around anyway. So they are watching where the heat is on more and sometimes not at all. Yes, uh, Evie. Yeah, I liked uh, most of what she had to say in the video with the possible exception of having a green team. I I'd like to think there should be a green sub team as part of every little subgroup in the church. 
instead of saying, well, now we have to recruit people and we need a chair and we're going to have that little separate group of people over there taking care of it. Uh, and then people are like, I don't have time to volunteer for that committee. But instead of all, have all the existing committees and preschool and uh, every existing group have it part of their own mission to see what we can do to improve things. And I bet you get a lot more interesting ideas that way anyhow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one thing we, we do in the council, I, 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 a kid, Pastor David, he likes to print out a lot of stuff. And uh, I, especially now that we're, a bit, we're back to being on Zoom meetings, you know, you could just show a PDF file or, or a Word document and share it instead of um, uh, printing out, uh, you know, stuff that just, you mean a handout for like 10 minutes worth of discussion. So uh, th things like that, we, we each committee group needs to think about um, what we're, you know, putting um, environmental impact, uh, you know, carbon footprint on what you're doing, how it affects the cost of, the, uh, of our church and, uh, and operating budget. You know, a, a, a byproduct of us talking as a church is also ideas, uh, experiences within the church get spread throughout the congregation. And they can apply a lot of that stuff in their homes. Lots of people don't think about it. Other people are uh, ahead. As we bring it into the church, it also goes out. And then it goes out to the extended families and everything. So this talking is a good thing. And on that line, I'd like to push ideas. What's coming? And uh you talked about solar power there's also going to be a huge huge change in the next five to ten years in storage batteries uh for homes for sure. cars for businesses uh everything and uh there's new batteries being developed that are just uh, amazing so that's coming uh, it's something we can keep in mind for the future. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of leads, it's um, uh, just past 11. I wanted to keep the uh, flow going. So it kind of leads towards our next topic, our next video I'm going to uh, display and, or show you guys. And it's, it starts going thinking about, so we talked about what the church can do. Now, let's, what can I do as an individual? So let me share that real quick. I'm just one person, and climate change is such a huge, overwhelming problem. No matter how hard I try, and no matter how small I shrink my carbon footprint, it won't make a difference, right? The average American emits about 18 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year, and the average Canadian about 16. That's four times the global average. To put it in perspective, it's the equivalent of each of us driving a mid-sized car around the entire circumference of the planet one time each year. There are so many climate-friendly steps we can take in our everyday life, and many of them will also save our pocketbooks. The very first step is the easiest and the most painless, I promise. What's your personal carbon footprint? Before you set about making it smaller, you first have to know how big it is and where is all this stuff coming from? Is it your house, your food, your travel? It's different for each of us because it depends on our lifestyle. There's a bunch of cool calculators available online that help you measure this. Just Google carbon calculator and you can find them. Once you know your carbon footprint and you know where it's coming from, then you can start making changes. These can be small things you do around the house like recycling, washing your clothes in cold water instead of hot water, which uses five times the energy, or swapping out old incandescent light bulbs for more efficient LEDs. Making the light bulb switch could cut your emissions from lighting by up to 85%. That's half a ton of carbon emissions every year for your household. And if everyone in America changed just one old incandescent bulb into a new LED, that would be like taking almost 800,000 cars off the road. We can make larger changes, like when it's time, purchasing an ENERGY STAR rated appliance. 
the next time we have to replace our fridge or our washing machine. If every new appliance had that rating, it would be the equivalent of taking about 350,000 cars off the road. Or you could make heating and cooling your home more efficient by caulking your leaky windows and adding insulation to your attic. If your house isn't weatherized, you're likely losing as much energy through air leaks each year as you would if you just left a window open the whole time. Doing something as simple as installing a $50 programmable thermostat could lower your energy bill and your emissions by 15%. As you can see these days, there are a lot of good options. And they also include options for powering your home with renewable energy. You could see if your energy utility offers a green power plan, or you could even have your own solar panels or your own personal little windmill installed on your roof. I live in Texas, and for many parts of the state, buying wind power for your home is just about the same price as getting it from natural gas or coal. There's also a lot we can do in our own diets. That includes eating locally produced foods, not wasting food, opting for tap water over bottled water, and eating lower in the food chain. That means more veggies and less meat. One pound of red meat creates about 18 times the amount of emissions as a pound of pasta. We can also look at the way we commute to work. We could consider carpooling, even once a week would help, biking to the office, think of the fitness benefits, or telecommuting to the office one day a week. I enjoy working my pajamas myself. My job involves a lot of business trips though where I can't wear pajamas. So I try to video conference into meetings when I can. And when air travel is unavoidable, I buy carbon credits to offset my travel. There's a lot of good companies that do this. The organization that I use, for example, is called Climate Stewards. They measure how much carbon my plane trip produced, and then they do things that make up for that same amount, like planting trees and buying efficient cook stoves for families in Ghana and Mexico and Kenya, so they don't have to chop down trees to cook their food. A full quarter of the average American's emissions come from driving. So one major step we can take when the time is right is to buy a fuel-efficient vehicle. Whether that means finding a car with the best fuel economy in its class or purchasing a hybrid or an electric vehicle. I drive a small hybrid SUV right now and more than anything, I would love for my next car to be a Tesla. I hope Elon Musk is watching this. The reality is we can make the biggest changes when we work together. So if you're serious at reducing the carbon footprint of your community, Talk to the people who pay the bills at your work or your church or your school or even your gym or your yoga studio. Encourage them to make smart choices too that save money and improve our quality of life. This could be as simple as encouraging your office to install those sensors that turn out the lights when people aren't there or encourage the gym to check out treadmills that could be plugged into the building's energy system. Why let all that running go to waste? You could install solar panels on the roof, or you could just paint it white if you live in a hot climate like I do to save on the air conditioning bills. We can all help by taking personal and communal steps to reduce our carbon emissions, and that will do a lot. But realistically, it won't be enough all by itself. Our personal choices control only about 40% of national emissions. And even then, we can't always afford to make the choices that we'd like to. The reality is the government also must act. But in a democracy, that's what it's there for, right? To do what we want it to. So really, the most important thing each of us can do is to let our elected representatives at City Hall, in the state capitol, or in Washington or Ottawa know that we're concerned about global warming, and we want them to address it, from tightening fuel standards to building a clean energy economy. This is a leadership issue and we don't yet have the ability to make some of the choices that each of us would like to. Now, if this sounds kind of scary, and it might, then I'd encourage you to check out a great organization called Citizens Climate Lobby. They have chapters all over the United States and Canada and around the world, and they're all just regular people helping each other figure out how you write a letter or an email or how you call or visit an elected official to tell them one simple message that we just need a price on carbon. I think they must be doing something right because Citizens Climate Lobby's Climate Solutions Caucus in the United States is the only one I know of that has the same number of Republican congressmen and women as it does Democrats. So wherever you are, wherever you're from, we all need to stand up together and make our voices heard. We all live on this planet. We all want a better future. And we're not gonna get there 
if we leave climate change out of the picture. All right, so that was our second video of the day. And uh, next question for the group would be, uh, so what changes, uh, <clears throat> what changes has uh, your church already made and what changes have you made as an individual to reduce your carbon footprint? Uh, what else could you have done at your church to act in community to help tackle climate change? And are there particular things that could be done to make your community aware that you are acting? All right, and go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, Ed. No, I just unmuted me. Okay. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. So we we talked about the lighting campaign and, and in the sanctuary that was a, a big deal. I'm not sure what our uh, uh, I don't know, Susan, if you remember or what did the contractor of, uh, provide us what were been our energy cost savings with the new lighting. I don't think that they provided what the cost would be. I don't know if Susie Oversby's on the class this morning, if she has an idea how much of a savings that would be. And I guess we'd probably just refer back to Krista, the treasurer, to see if we've seen a reduction in our heating bills as well, too. Although it's, um, or electrical bill. It's kind of hard as well, since we haven't been in the church and using those that area as well too. So I don't know, but obviously there is a, a great amount of savings with uh, the LED over what we had. Yeah. Well, I have one more thing that uh, it may seem small, but since the commons was built, there are lights that have been wired that burn 24, seven, 54 weeks, 365 days for three years, they're continuously burning. And the come back to me when I mentioned this to property and grounds is it would cost more to hire an electrician to rewire it than it is uh, we would save in our energy bill, which I think is not the direction we should be going. We should get those lights there. They're on the entrance and they go 24 seven all 65 days of the year for the past three years. Okay, so that's maybe a small amount. I mean, it may even cost us to do that, but isn't it worth it in the end to save our planet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Marco? Yep, go ahead. I, think, I, I appreciate uh, Lee's concern. I just, uh, I've heard that part of the reason is because it's for security. So there are probably multiple issues there that probably need to be checked out. And I, I noticed that Debbie was trying to talk oh, earlier. <laughs> okay, I was just gonna share that I installed a re two recirculating pumps in my home. And when I installed the first one, my handyman really poo-pooed it. He said, you know, it's not gonna be worth the amount of money that you're gonna save. The, the um, pump is going to take more energy to run. Well, the pump is about this big. My handyman installed it and immediately I had hot water and he just said, I'm going home and I'm going to put one of these in my home. They're very inexpensive and you get immediate hot water. And then I turned out that I have two supply lines. And so I ended up putting one on my kitchen sink. And um, anyway, I think that's a simple way. I read when I was down in Disneyland last month that um, just leaving water on for an extra minute is like, a, I can't remember, five gallons of water. It's, it varies. I went online to confirm it. But anyway, just letting water run, we're wasting gallons and gallons of water. And now when I turn on my shower, I have instant hot water. So anyway, for a very low cost, actually. Yeah, I, I end up uh, <laughs> turning on the heat, uh, the hot water on. It takes, you know, I'm on the third floor. My water heater's on the first floor it takes a little while to get up there and it does you know, I do think about how much water I'm wasting just to get to that hot water so uh, um, we've got a bit of a list here of things that we do and uh, could could 
go through the list, Debbie? So here are some things that other people haven't mentioned, so, so I don't repeat stuff. Uh, we don't use our dryer. It came with a house, so I'm pretty sure it's about 30 years old. And uh, maybe I use it once a year for something, but we put our clothes on a, uh, on a hanging line. It's a little setup that takes about the, I don't know, three feet by five feet amount of floor space. Summers we put it outside and winters we have it in the living room. It dries our clothes. Um, mm -hmm. We have one hybrid car and another car from 1983 that might someday fall apart, but it hasn't yet. But, but keeping cars for a long time and having local people repair those cars, because there's intrinsic energy going into anything that's built, that is, if you can keep that as longer, then that energy usage is spread out over a longer period of time. Uh, certainly not always, but we try to buy local food and we try to buy in bulk so you just get less packaging with it. Uh, we cook at home. Since the pandemic started, I think we've eaten in a restaurant maybe twice. Uh, and that was pretty much our habit pre-pandemic too. We have plant-based diets and all that like reduce, reuse, recycle stuff's great, but I would encourage us all to just buy less stuff to start with. <laughs> um, we have one of those soda stream things, so we're not always buying canned fizzy beverages. Uh, we've divested from petroleum companies. Uh, I think everything else is a repeat of what everybody else uh, said. Well, we, we, we took our garbage service and reduced it to one pickup a month. And, right. and uh, that drives you to fill up the can less. And when you purchase, <laughs> we, we'd like to purchase a lot of stuff in bulk. And so when you purchase in bulk, you don't get as much garbage. And so you look at what you're buying and is it just over packaged? Is that going to cause your garbage to just be overrun? So with the one can a month, sometimes we don't even fill it up. Um, <laughs> we, we compost all of our food waste and we, we grow a garden as well. So there's our little list, not to brag or anything, just telling you how it is. Just some ideas. <laughs> you guys get the gold star for today, that's for sure. So. <laughs> but I also remember back, you know, this is way before the church remodel project when we used to use styrofoam cups. And it seemed to be a big deal at the time to go from styrofoam cups to uh, ceramic cups. Uh, but we made it, and we're on the other side of it, and we probably don't even think about that anymore. Golly, I miss the styrofoam cups. No, nobody says that anymore. So, you know, I think uh, that's just a step in the right direction that we can think, yeah, whatever the next styrofoam cup is, we can do that too. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's all about a mental, uh, you know, change. Something's Something little as that it sounds ridiculous, but it, it's a mental, you know, we don't like change and uh, human, you know, human natural instinct is just keep things as is uh, on, on some things, not all things, but no, definitely. Yeah. That, what, so that's a good question. What is our next styrofoam cup for our church and for our lives? Um, I think that we are not going to be able to really think about, I guess we can think about it, but actually react on something like that until we are all together again in one space to know exactly <laughs> what kinds of things that we're overlooking or how we can pursue it. I don't know. What do you think? Yes, uh, but uh, we can al we can always, uh, like I said, I, I want to bring this up to our next our next council meetings on the fifteenth. And, you know, and, and Susie Oversee is also, she works for uh, PUD and she's on board to try to help church get uh, uh, information how we can, you know, procure some of these uh, energy technologies uh, and, and do an energy audit for a lower cost than, what, you know, mm -hmm. coming right off, you know. Yeah, Tim. Thank you. Um, I, I got curious while you guys were talking. I'm, I'm also doing the dishes, by the way. <laughs> I got curious and I, I looked up the PUD, uh, their proportion of where their energy comes from. 
0% of PUD power is coal, 76% is hydro, 0% is natural gas, 10% nuclear, 8% wind, and then 1% other and 5% unspecified. So you could say that uh, counting the hydro and the wind, we're talking something like 84% or more than that. Yeah, 84% green. If you want to, depending on how you feel about nuclear, that could be 94% green. So I, I think, in, you know, it's, it's, it is certainly laudable to try to cut our electrical energy use. But I think in terms of the environment, we might be more effective in trying to cut down the use of natural gas and the and automotive fuel as well. Those are two areas we could really help. So just thought you guys might want to know that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tim, for looking oh, at that. Throw in uh, being aware that petroleum is the basis of most plastics, nylons, and stuff like that. Uh, you need to, when you're looking at uh, windows, a siding, is plastic the way to go? Uh, is there a better way? Um, uh, packaging. I, 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 we have forests. We say save the trees. Let's grow more trees so that we can use paper and not use uh, petroleum. Is that is the worst thing with petroleum? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the ongoing discussion, you know, we can't walk away from petroleum, um, you know, today, there's still, there, we, we need to look at, well, and it's a global issue, uh, you know, but we can all, you know, we're, we're talking about what locally we can do, but it, then that conversation keeps growing to the uh, state and national and, and, and international conversations, which they are, that, I mean, we have these COP, Agreements and uh, every, uh, every five years and reviewing with the Paris Accords, uh, but we're still it, it's it's continuing improvement in technologies like you keep talking about the Elon Musk batteries every every weekend, but it um, it's, it's the continuing uh, um, uh, identifying new uh, technologies and using those and, and and changing to those new technologies. So like I said before. Are, it's sometimes the little things are hard to change, but then when you start doing it, uh, using that uh, new process or whatever the case, that we can, it gets easier. Yes, Tim. Oh, okay. Um, I am a little nervous about uh, what's being done with our recycled plastic. I'm trying, I'm trying to lower my hand and it keeps, there we go, there. Okay. Um, I had a friend recently that went to the Stomish County uh, solid waste thing and he was recycling stuff. And he was, he said there was a thing for cardboard, mixed paper and organic stuff, but there was no collection point for plastic. And I know that, uh, oh gee, what's the, what is the firm in, in town? Rubitino. They, I, I've been religiously, you know, pulling the labels off my plastic and, and taking the little extra thing off of the uh, milk jug so it's just one kind of plastic <laughs> when I recycle them, what happens to them? Where do they go after Rubitino? If the county's not taking them, who is taking our plastic? Because you're right, we have a tremendous amount of plastic and packaging. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and, yeah, so to your point, and the one thing I, I watched, uh, um, uh, a show on HBO about uh, recycling. This issue was uh, actually was on John Oliver's show, but uh, um, besides, but he had a good point. So one thing, just like this Gatorade bottle, I'm drinking Gatorade instead of coffee this morning to keep my jitters down. But <laughs> look, the thing about it, 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 you have to be aware of. Not all plastic is recyclable. If it doesn't, you, if you look at the little triangle on the bottom, if it doesn't say one or two. You can't recycle it, and a lot of our food products that you you know get uh, uh, in, in grocery stores and other plastics, even this plastic cap, 
this is not recyclable, but the bottle is. And so it, it, you'll see numbers uh, three through seven and some other care, other letters, I think, if I remember right. But those are not those are not currently recyclable or it costs too much money. There is no return in the investment. Uh, and in, in, in businesses and corporations don't, they're not going to, they're not going to do, they're not going to, you know, lose money just to save uh, uh, a plastic. So uh, um, the the plastic thing is a huge problem, and I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but one of the big people backers of the recycling plastics were the petroleum product companies, the petroleum companies, uh, because they wanted to continue to produce their plastic products and sell them, but but then now we have all this plastic and to, to recycle things, you have to have a market for the product that you're recycling. You have to have a market for that plastic. And when there's not a market, like there isn't right now, most of that plastic that goes into your recycle bin is just being landfilled and, and, and not being used at all. So mm -hmm. this whole recycling thing was really for the plastic, a big scam <laughs> on this part of the petroleum industry. Well, America, America used to send a whole lot of the recyclables to China, and that's not happening at the rate that it used to. I don't have any statistics on that. But just because something has the right recyclable number on it doesn't mean it's getting recycled. No, it's getting landfilled most of the time. Now, we lived in our old house for almost 35 years. Always did the Rubatino thing. We had the three little bins, and you're right. I was sorting all the plastic and sorting the cans, and everything was separate. And then we watched them when the truck rolls up in front of the house. It all gets dumped <laughs> together in the truck. It's like, what the heck are we doing? And then you hear that when we moved to the mobile home park, there's like 200 mobile homes here. And they said, we don't recycle because we can find no one to take it. They, we would recycle and turn it in and they collect the trash here. And then nobody was like you said, buying it or wanting it. And so they didn't know what to do with, so they just stopped recycling totally. So we have no outlet right now to recycle. We sometimes send it home with our kids because they live in Montlake Terrace and Marysville and they have one big bin and everything goes in that. But I, you know, our recycling efforts have kind of been thwarted because they can't find anybody to take it. Marianne? Yeah, the, the, you know, the thing is just don't buy it. Just don't yeah. buy it. <laughs> Marianne, I agree with you. I, we too have the three bins separated out and I watch them. They pick them up and they throw them all in one bin in the little tricycle thing that they run up and down the street. I'm going, why are we bothering? When it first started, they said, we're trying two different systems and some neighborhoods will get one big thing. And then you might be in a neighborhood where you have to separate it, mm -hmm. but we'll see which one works the best. And then we'll all switch to that. Well, they never switched us off. So, you know, I guess so you're, you're saying that we were the great experiment. Yeah. Way <laughs> back, uh, way back. No, we were know. scammed. <laughs> uh, and Evelyn and Mark pointed it out. About a year ago, maybe a little more, there was a big report on the news. What percentage of plastic is recycled? And they uh, talked about how the plastic industry uh, realized that they were polluting and it, it was hard to do. So they said, okay, let's recycle. And they started up a big company. They paid out millions and billions of dollars uh, with CEOs and all the stuff and publications to uh, say recycling was the answer. Well, there's certain plastics that cannot be recycled. Maybe there's other plastics that only can be done once or twice, but every time it's recycled, it loses uh, potential uh, uh, effectiveness of the recycling. And so there's a big scam that's been going on for the last how many years? 40, 50 years? I don't know. Uh, it's time that we realize this. And like you said, maybe not buy stuff that's uh, 
Package I've been putting my produce in my shopping cart without being in a bag. Mm-hmm. And the last time I got up to the check stand, she pulled out a bag from underneath and stuffed it in there and gave it to me in the bag. I'm just like, what the heck? I didn't put it in a bag on purpose. Mm-hmm. And she's giving me what. So what's the answer uh, to this scam that if we're being scammed, is it a political answer? Because our moderator mentioned get involved in politics and call your representative. And are there laws that could prevent companies from scamming us? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is a tough question. And, and, and you know, just like what's going on right now in Olympia, or, or, you know, they, they decide what topics and laws are going to uh, look at. Uh, so there's a process and it doesn't happen. Over, unfortunately, doesn't, you can't make a law overnight. Uh, so, you know, it, it, all these different sessions in, in, in the local and state and national governments, it's, you know, all the, it's, it's, it's helping these other smaller groups. You know, individually, you can't do it. You can't fix it. But you you can support these other groups that she was talking about, and there's other there's more other groups out there, um, and uh, and I even I, I sent the, uh, about the ELCA last week, uh, uh, you know options there, uh, so they they can um, uh, 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 facilitate those conversations, and with the more more backing, uh, financial backing, and and, and, and numbers of people uh, to help. Uh, push these laws in there and create these laws. I think Dennis is anxious to add something to this conversation, I can tell. Uh, you're you're muted, muted, Dennis. Yeah, okay, so so uh, the thought to me uh, that I, I think the response is, requires legislative response for most of this because individually we're really limited on what we can do, even though it does make a difference. So I'm curious as to what the uh, major environmental groups um, might have in terms of proposed legislation that we could support and promote. And we could include that in the way we talk about uh, the environment because just individually acknowledging there's a problem, not gonna change it. We need to be able to advocate for very specific things. So for example, what if we, proposed legislation that um, um, all of the produce bags had to be made with um, vegetable-based bags? What if we proposed legislation that you couldn't um, sell? um, What do we get that's, oh yeah, we buy vitamins. You should see the packaging that comes on vitamins and it's not necessary. There's a little bottle there, but they have this huge package that goes with it. you know, that's unnecessary, even though it might promote their product better. And so I'm looking for more specific ways that we could actually say, uh, uh, when we talk about things, when we talk to people with legislative voices or representatives, this is what we want. We could even help draft legislation if it gets to that. But I, to make systemic change requires way more organization than what we can do locally. So, so a few years ago, I, I set my New Year's resolution to write once a month, no, once a week to my legislators, once a week. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Right? What are you writing them about? <laughs> whatever comes to mind. <laughs> it's not focused, it's whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Ed. Well, it, we we have a representative in our congregation. Congregation, mm-hmm. why don't we invite uh, Rick Larson to sit down with us and and hear what he has to say about what kind of input he gets and what he's doing about that? Um, make sure he's aware of what we're doing and and could maybe advise us uh, on ways that we could even be more effective in. Uh, advocating for uh, change. Um, Perfect it, idea. Yeah. I mean, I think we're lucky to have him when he's around when because he's, he's around. gone, gone yeah. a lot, but um, he's very receptive. I've talked to him many times when I've seen him at church and 
And, Wife uh, plays a mean violin too. <laughs> <laughs> but he could join us via Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he sure could. Yeah. Um, did we invite him? I don't, he must see this stuff, but. Um, you know, I, I agree. That's a great idea. The few times I have interacted with him, he uh, very enlightening and and helped me, you know, uh, uh, over several different matters. And just a wonderful person. It'd be great if he could come on board. Yeah, yeah I'll definitely put a, a feeler out there. I'll talk to Pastor David how we can uh, facilitate that conversation and not just on climate justice but uh all social justice and all the all the things that we're we've been looking at in our adult learning and talking about and, and during our worship services and, and and see how we can help and improve our our community and our in our in our in our country mm -hmm. I know on and off we've had members of the city council. I think that's a great idea, community. Marco, to really see how we can be better. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> I got this is I I I was wondering if this is this this section of the class was going to uh, start running over, but uh, it's, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad we're having these conversations. So. Um, uh, Ed, real quick, and then I want to continue on. We have one more hot topic to talk about. Christian Century Magazine for uh, January the 26th. According to consumer advocacy, uh, Biden uh, uh, administration has been granting more monthly drilling permits on federal land than the Trump administration did during its first three years. It's also poised to open up new drilling off the Alaska coast later this year well that's that's this disheartening to hear that yeah uh yes marianne then we gotta go, go to the next topic uh, just real quickly we have somebody else at church who's really involved with our state legislature and he's up in the corner it's Tim, <laughs> and i know he's working for the retired educators but they have established an incredible network of letter writers and buddies to the legislators during the session to keep everybody in Olympia concerned with our pension issues, but we could also activate the same type of idea to get them involved in climate issues. But you kind of have to know who down there in Olympia is on what committee, because depending on the committee they're on, that's where you've got the power. Because somebody in a committee, if they decide they don't like the legislation and they've got the power, they can squash it and it'll never come to the floor for discussion or a vote. So we've got to get some in so that we know. And Tim has some really good connections with all the legislators. Uh, so, you know, they've spent a lot of time. They have a legislative advocate, full time person, and he's got this kind of network. And I don't see why we couldn't build on that network to, to get to the ones we need to know about statewide. I would, yep. agree. I would agree with that statement and just repeat that our governor is, well, is really a Democrat that works and looks at climate change. Yeah, thank you, Chris. All right, so let me, uh, I think we kind of bled into our next question. So we'll go briefly talk about it and then we'll show our last video of the day. So let me share my screen and go ahead and mute yourselves uh, so that, uh, let's see. So we just talked about uh, talking to our, our church members that are in politics, but um, have you found any other resources, organizations, authors, podcasts that you can share to help others reduce their carbon footprint? And there are other ways that your church could facilitate sharing that information and resources for sustainable living. So yes, <laughs> um, that, what one thing I liked about this, you know, whenever I or whenever adult learning does these classes, you know, it's not just a facilitator, myself or Rick or Carol, that um, you come, you can always uh, provide feedback to everybody. And I've gotten some back from Beth and from Rick and from uh, Chang. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, everyone is welcome. <clears throat> excuse me. Everyone's welcome to respond to everybody or my emails to the group and say, "Hey, what about this?" Or I found this online uh, and share. Basically, you know, sharing is caring. So 
uh, if we if we uh, have those availability to everybody, so everybody can look at it, um, that would be great as we keep, go forward in the, not just this class, but with all other uh, um, items that we have for our adult learning and, and our topics for our church. So let me um, let me uh, see change to the video real quick. in which we can engage in the climate change debate and gently point people to Jesus. I want to offer four specific thoughts for having these conversations. And the first one is this. Do not engage out of guilt. Because one of the hallmarks of what we believe is that we have been freed from that guilt. We act from the heart because we've been given new hearts that want to do what's right, that we don't just live in fear of punishment from God, we live in the hope and the freedom that Christ's sacrifice brought us. As it says in Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because we don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And in Hebrews 10, it talks about how the sacrifices under the law were not able to free people from guilt for their sins because it was not able to make them perfect. But, as it continues on in the chapter, it says, By one sacrifice Christ did make us perfect. All of those who are being sanctified in our behavior, it doesn't mean our behavior is perfect. We all know that's not true. But it does mean that we have been freed from the price of sin because the price of sin was death. Christ paid it. And that means that we can walk in newness of life. So motivating people out of guilt is not what we have to do. I still remember one of the very first round tables I went to that had Christian leaders from many different denominations, Protestant, Catholic, and more. And as we were sitting there at that table, with most people who had flown to that location, and as we all know, flying is one of the most carbon intensive ways we can transport ourselves around the world, one person leaned across the table and he said, you know, every time you turn on your car, you're sinning. I thought to myself, oh, so when I go to church, I'm sinning. Coming to this meeting was sinning. Going to my job is sinning. Taking my child to the doctor if they're sick is sinning. I just wanted to go out to the parking lot, find the nearest Hummer. This meeting happened in Texas, so I imagine there would have been a Hummer nearby. Find the nearest Hummer and just drive circles around him going, sinning, I'm sinning. Guilt is not how we are intended to be motivated, and God knows this, and that's why we have been freed from guilt by Christ's sacrifice. And so the first thing we need to do is not pass that guilt on, but rather acknowledge that we are free. And because we are free, we can choose to do the right thing. And how do we choose? That brings me to my second point, not out of fear. I love this verse from Timothy because it provides a litmus test. So much of our conversation about climate change, whether we fear the unchecked impacts of climate change or whether we fear the solutions of climate change, so much of that conversation revolves around fear. Yet in Timothy, the Apostle Paul tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if we are feeling fear, that fear is not coming from God. Instead, God has given us power. And this is very important. It's not a word we use very often, but we do use a derivative of it, which is empowered. Empowered means we are capable of acting. And fear, on the other hand, can spark a short-term reaction. But long-term fear and anxiety will paralyze us. So being empowered, having a spirit of power, means that rather than being paralyzed by fear, we are able to act. How? out of love, having compassion for others, caring for their needs, and, I love this last one, with a sound mind. Using the sound mind that God gave us to make good decisions based on the information that we see in his creation. So how do we have conversations with fellow Christ followers? Not out of guilt, not out of fear, but, number three, in love. We are to be recognized by our love for others, and we are told to walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Walking in love, and lastly, in hope too. 
Over the last two years, I would say that the most frequent question that I have gotten from anywhere in any group in any organization I've spoken to, young or old, Christian or secular, North America or European, the most frequent question I have got is what gives you hope? And as Christians, we know that hope comes from a very counterintuitive place. In the book of Romans, Paul writes that we know that troubles help us learn not to give up. So he begins with troubles. Troubles help us learn not to give up. When we have learned not to give up, it shows that we have stood the test. When we have stood the test, it gives us hope. And hope never makes us ashamed, or another translation would say it never disappoints, because the love of God has come into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we have hope. Not guilt, not fear, love, hope, and a sound mind are how we can engage with each other. And these are the values and the gifts from God, really, that we can connect with in others and inspire with others. All right. <clears throat> That's our last question of the day. Uh, Dr. He uh, Hayhoe says, we, we should not engage with the issue of climate change out of guilt because a Christian, as Christians, we believe we are, we are free from guilt. Did that make you realize that guilt plays a part in how you respond to climate change? And how does the gospel alter this response? So we, I don't want to go any more than 15 minutes so we're a little over time, but you know, that, this, this is one thing, uh, you know, and this, this can go towards any, any subject. And if you, if you try it, if you, guilt somebody uh, to make them believe what you want to believe, they're going to turn off their ears and, uh, and not listen to you. So, you know, what we're doing here, we're just talking about it. We're not, we're not pointing fingers at anybody, but we're, we're identifying issues and how, and, and how to go forward in that direction. Yes, Dennis. Well, I, I, um, as I was listening to her, it struck me that uh, one of the most impactful things that I had in my working life was when I was, um, I had the privilege of being invited to Native American powwows uh, while I worked in prisons. And um, what the initially struck me was the way that the reverence they have for Mother Earth. And they speak of God as Mother Earth. And everything revolves around their relationship with Mother Earth. And, and the mother part is important because it, it, it denotes a, a responsibility to treat the, the planet as you'd treat someone you love most in the world. And I think um, for me, I think language is really important because we have a, a high percentage of people in our country who choose to believe that it's not a problem. And so we need to um, find some way to motivate people to be respectful and support these policies because of love of earth rather than any guilt that they might have uh, or people are trying to force on them for, uh, you know, asking them to give up their Hummer. Just, I think language is important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dennis. Anybody else? Yes, Amy. So, I mean, there's two sides to the guilt thing. One is the giving side and the other is the receiving side. And uh, I think from sometimes feeling like I'm on the receiving side when somebody says, well, airplane travel is a huge carbon footprint problem. So, then what? So maybe, you know, of course, the last time I rode a plane was pre pandemic. And even then, you know, at the most once every year or two, then I try to look at the big picture and think, well, gee, when I was working for the phone company, we would have these vendors come and they would, you know, make three flights a week, round trip, six flight legs a week. And somehow I'm feeling bad because somebody wants me to guilt me into that, you know, my one flight every other year to visit my brother is somehow a horrible thing. So I think it's important to keep sight of the big picture without getting stuck in the weeds sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So Jim, uh, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, a different way of looking at it is maybe COVID's a gift. 
uh, we're using uh, a lot less traffic in some cases uh, because we're staying at home and using Zoom. And the technology just happens to come in in the last few years where we oh, can absolutely. do that. Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. The drawback would be uh, fewer people are carpooling. <laughs> yeah, so like with this pandemic, uh, you know, myself and a lot of people, um, uh, we, we just work from home. Uh, we, there's no reason to go to an office or it's not safe to go to an office. Like, you know, in our current wave that we're in, uh, it's not safe, but, um, or, or what is the advantage of, you know, you know, that's one thing we're looking at now in businesses is, you know, can we get, you know, do we need to travel? Can we, can we do a, uh, a go on, on Zoom, WebEx, Teams or whatever, uh, Skype or whatever uh, uh, medium that, but you can communicate and, and at least see face to face. You may not be able to, you know, shake their per, that person's hand or whatever the case, but uh, you can still have that meaningful conversation. The developing art. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. For, for for the younger younger than me, even younger than me, uh, they're they're having an easier time. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, it, it 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 was a little bit weird when I stayed home and started doing the work, and you just you have to learn to over or communicate more than you had to instead of going to somebody's uh, desk and say, "Hey, what about this?" You would have to. It's more typing, more. Um, setting up meetings just to convey that information. Yes, Beth, you, uh, you have some. Uh oh. All right. Um, anything else you want to talk about before we uh, close up? Yeah, I really appreciate you guys. I, it, I always know we're going to go over because uh, the, the, the topics are. Are, are good and tough and that's what makes us uh, stronger so I appreciate that for everybody so let's go ahead thank you all and, for being here well, excuse me thank you all for being here and doing yes, this yes thank you all right let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer dear lord jesus thank you for this day thank you for everything you've given us thank you for your grace that we are saved through you and we don't have to earn it. We don't, nor do we deserve it. We learned that today. We, it's it, you know, we we church in our our, our community, our individual uh, families, and what are our own practices of changing. Sometimes these changes can be difficult, but you, you've given us the strength to go through these changes to become closer to you, and closer to a, a family of, of, of fellow um, Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Just like I said before, Thank if you, you have something in your mind or you, you found a link, go ahead and share, uh, not just to me, but also to everybody in the group, if, if you're willing to do that. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Marco. Blessings all. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Marco. Bye.